Okay, what I'd like to talk about now, I'd like us to shift a little bit into um, sort of a little bit like what you guys are doing on this homework, okay? Um, what I would say is that there is this notion of either, depending on who you talk about it, data munging or data wrangling, which is this idea of preparing data sets for analysis. And, um, you know, like I said, there's two kinds of data scientists, the people who complain that they don't have data and the people who make sure they get data, okay? And um, usually, if you said, what does a data scientist do with most of their time at work, it is not going to be um, doing deep statistical tests or reasoning. It's going to be wrestling with their data and getting it into shape for doing some kind of a serious analysis. So a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the effort is about, um, you know, I will say preparation. And so what I'd like to do for the next couple of days, this class, and maybe, uh, may maybe one more, who knows, we'll see what happens, is talk a little bit about the preparation process of data. How do you acquire data? How do you beat it into shape? How do you clean it up? Okay? Because these are actually important things. And again, what, one thing that I firmly believe in these kinds of subjects is that people go wrong usually at relatively elementary things. It's not the case that, oh, did I use the right statistical test for this? It's did I mess up my data from the beginning, okay? And quite often, people, t distressingly often, when I put students to work on projects, they will come back with graphs uh, that mean nothing. They will have, um, you know, uh, data sets that, uh, that, that, that weren't properly formatted and couldn't be interpreted or something like this. And so the, the kind of the cleaning process, the wrangling process is an important part of what we're doing, okay? It may be kind of bored, boring for me to lecture to you, but it's kind of important to realize that that's kind of where most people go wrong. Any questions? Okay. So let me first talk about programming languages. Because again, in principle, we're now going to go through the, the, you're now at the point where we're now going to be trying to actually manipulate data. What are the tools that we should use? Maybe the most important tool that you use is your programming language. And there are a bunch of different kinds of programming languages people use in data science contexts. Um, the one that most of you should be using in here is Python, because you found that, uh, what you call it, you, you know, it, 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 it is very good for doing a lot of relatively simple operations on data, and it tends to have amazing libraries that other, of stuff other people wrote that are the kind of things, you, there seems to be a culture of people write things and make it available. So there's, what's the most amazing thing you have found in Python library? What? Pandas, and what does that do? It's meant for like data, it, it can do a lot of things, like relate to data cleaning, to slicing and combining and aggregating. And the, the best part about it is it can, it can present data in a proper data format. Like it can convert data from different formats and structure it well in pandas. And it's documented and the recorded. Pandas oh. taking the raw files properly, even if like the data itself was not like do proper delimitation or like, like if it's oh. just directly you have numpy, it is going to Okay, so anyway, the claim is that it's a, it, 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 it's, it's a way of structuring data, basically. It's a library for sort of structuring data for subsequent analysis. That's basically what I think that that is. Any other libraries or little things that people were amazed to find? Okay, matplotlib is a library that will plot things a zillion ways, okay? And often, if you want a plot of a particular type, Either you can program it up, or more likely somebody else did something like that. So, so anyway, so Python is a great thing. Um, okay, what are the languages that people care about? There is R, which is a programming language for statisticians. We have at least one R expert in the class, apparently. Um, don't, 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 no, don't be embarrassed. There's nothing wrong with that. I, actually, it's a, it's, it's a good thing for statistical analysis. It's, 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 you know, it's the convention for statisticians. And... Uh, you know, and, and, you know, very good for doing a lot of statistical analysis. MATLAB is um, a, a system that's very good for fast manipulation of matrices. A lot of stuff that we're going to be doing in here towards the latter part of the class are going to involve work manipulating matrix, you know, matrices, and MATLAB is, is, is a good thing for doing that in. Um, 
a lot of the time when people think about data science, what they're really thinking about are building systems that work with vast amounts of data. So if you are working for Google or Facebook, okay, on some level you're analyzing the entire web or the you know, entire social network of the universe. And for these things, you need to usually use a real traditional language because the scale of what you're doing is so large where it's something that you're drive, working on is being driven by system issues or scale issues. Often you have to go to languages like that. Um, how many people have ever used Mathematica? Okay, I have a warm spot for Mathematica. Um, how many people have used Wolfram Alpha? Okay, that's kind of actually has Mathematica under the hood. This is a language slash system for doing symbolic manipulation of mathematics. It's a programming language, uh, you know, a functional like programming language underneath it. And um, they also have a lot of packages and things like this. So there's certain kinds of things, like especially if you're going to be working with symbolic mathematics, that this is a useful tool for. Okay? And finally, something like Excel. You know, usually you're saying, oh, if I have pandas, I get a matrix, a table out of it. If you have one table, Excel spreadsheets that let you interact with it are a surprisingly useful thing to be able to work with. Okay? So often what happens is you'll be doing an analysis, you'll be building up after a long chain of operations a, a, a big matrix. Okay? It's a perfectly reputable thing to look at that then under a, something like Excel and try to look at it and analyze it with that. Just because that gives you a level of interaction that I think is better than some of these other languages. Any questions? Okay. Now, I don't really care. I, I, I recommend you use Python in here. I don't really, really, really care if you use something different. But what I do care about is that you use it in what I call a notebook environment. Okay? And by now, hopefully, you've got some idea of what I'm meaning by this. But that, um, you know, for example, this is a page from a notebook for um, IPython or Jupyter, I believe, okay, that lets you integrate, you know, code with the results of running the code with documentation to produce a runnable, um, readable thing, viewable thing that kind of captures what you're doing in your project. Yeah. Okay, I believe that the best thing to do is to work on it in the notebook environment, okay? How many people agree with that? Again, you can imagine there's two different ways you're working. One is that you're coding it and using it in the notebook environment. The other is you've got some shell on the side and you're, 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 you're hacking on the shell and when it's good enough, you stick it in there. I usually would, 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 would work in the notebook, okay? And you know it shows you know and 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 keep track of my false starts, keep track of my uh, you know everything that I'm kind of doing here, okay? Because again, the thing that is um, essential is that when you do one of these data projects, because the place where people make the mistake is usually at the beginning. Usually, the way a project would go is I build the data matrix, I start to do some analysis. I realized my data matrix was, was messed up, okay? I now have to go back and fix my data matrix again, right? And, you know, it, it, it's important that when you get a project that, that, that you be able to tweak it, you be able to play with it, you be able to do these things with it. And the worst kind of project is when I have a student who will, will claim to have done some very complicated calculations, they get a big data file, they delete the outliers by hand. They use a text editor to go and, uh, and convert everything to a different format. And they give it to me, and I tell them, well, wait, at the beginning you messed this up. And they'll say, oh, that's too far back now. I can't change that now. Because if I change that, I've got to go find out all my handwritten edit deletions and all of these kind of things. So it's important to have the discipline. First of all, it's important to kind of have the discipline that everything is happening as transformations that are potentially undoable, okay? And the way that you make it undoable is that you keep the workflow recorded in the notebook 
and then you can always rerun the notebook from some point to do this. Any questions about that? Okay. So this is the one thing that I absolutely insist on. And if you know, we, 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 if in the course of your projects you come back to me showing me some matrix that 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 came from half editing and half uh, doing these things, and you did some transformations, and you can't get back to where you started from, then then that's a bad sign. Okay. Any questions about it? Okay. And notebooks are the way to kind of do that. Any questions? And again, that basically the whole principle is that again we talk about data pipelines. Your 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 projects typically are raw data files coming in, clean them, clean them, clean them, merge them, merge them. Okay, do some analysis on them. Okay, it's important that you maintain it in a notebook so that if at some point you realize you have to change or upgrade date one of the files, okay, that everything else can be made to happen mechanically to do it again. Any questions? So you have to expect that you're going to be redoing your analysis from scratch. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay. I know this is like telling people to brush their teeth, okay, but basically that's, you know, th th this is what this is an important thing. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, so um let's talk about data formats. Now, um when you're going to be taking your data file formats, okay, typically there's a couple things that happen. Why do we care about data formats? We care about them for reading and we care about them for writing. Typically somebody else used a data format in the data set that you're going to be taking. You obviously have to read what they are doing. Hopefully they used a standard kind of a format in producing what they, uh, what, you know, what, what, what they had. The most common kind of standards that I think you should see now are things like CSV files. What does CSV stand for? Okay, and this is kind of a way of representing tables in a spreadsheet. Okay, and um, you know, this is useful because w one reason these standards are useful is because, first of all, there's tools that exist to parse them and tools that exist to read them. Does anyone smell anything burning? Decide, okay, okay, we'll keep it on that side then. Okay, um, okay, let us know if, let us know if there's any, anyone sees fire or anything, let me know. Um, okay, so um, what do I want to say? So one thing about CSV files is it's very, very easy to take columns of numbers and print them out with commas in them. But that's not always the same thing as meaning that you can read them. So you could imagine a text string that goes, you know, um, you know, I don't know. You could imagine um, something, comma, something, comma, something, comma, something, where this thing has a comma in it, right? And now it's going to get confused when you try to read these things. So recognize that the word comma separated file, the way I interpret it is something that Microsoft Excel can read. That is what I interpret. You know, what is the standard? It's whatever Microsoft can read. One way to tell whether your file makes any sense is, of course, to open it up in Excel and see whether or not uh, th they have trouble parsing that kind of thing. Okay, another standard for data, when you have structured data that is not a table, there's this language called XML, this way of XML, that's a way of a language for sort of describing data that's sort of kind of a uh, uh, build on onto HTML, which was the language for building web pages. You may remember in, web, in HTML, you specify these bracketing commands. Start italics, end italics, put the thing in italics there. And if you want to build, build something that um, represents marked up text or structured, you know, structured but not tabular things, like marked up text, or, um, or you know, regular kind of structures, XML is a good thing to do. Any questions? And again, XML means when something is in XML, there are tools that can read it and parse it and all. And again, I recommend that you don't just put things with bracketing commands. You actually have to check, and it's often a pain to get something accepted as real XML. But, uh, but, but that's useful if you're going to use the file later on. Any questions? 
Okay, JSON is a thing that people are used these days a lot in APIs. It is a way to sort of send variables around from program to program. And um, so if you have an API, meaning some kind of, you're writing a, 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 a program that's going to provide access on top of your data, this is a standard interface for it. Um, SQL databases are good things if you're going to have multiple tables, okay? And bottom line is, it, you know, I guess the point, point here is it's good to use a standard data format. And the reason it's good is because you have tools that can, people can build tools, use tools on your data set and easily read or write it. Any questions? Okay, that I can believe is boring. Okay, what I'd like to now talk about that's maybe, you know, maybe a little bit more interesting is this question of where does data come from, okay? That, um, that in most data science projects, the rate limiting step or a critical step is finding what is the appropriate data to work with. And, um, you know, the, you guys in a few weeks, we're gonna start thinking about doing projects in here. Usually what makes a project work or doesn't work is if you have an interesting data set to do something with it. You have some idea of something you want to do. You have some, some you know, algorithm that, that can seemingly do something on a data set. Where it becomes interesting is when you find the right, the right data set that will tell you something interesting from your analysis. So I'd like to spend, you know, the next several minutes, may, may, maybe, you know, to, well, a, a while, talking about how you find data sets. Because you know, th there's a certain level of searching for this that is kind of important. Um, and one reason why it's hard is often the data that you really want for a project isn't, let's say, it isn't obvious that the data set was designed to do what you want, okay? A lot of the things that you want are often what I would say metadata associated with a project. There's something that's, that's not the reason why the system exists, but sort of an auxiliary part of the data is kind of an important thing. Like, for example, Wikipedia is Wikipedia. We care about Wikipedia because it's an encyclopedia and making an encyclopedia, you know, and, and, and the real contents is the encyclopedia contents. But there are an amazing number of projects people have worked on using just the edit history of Wikipedia pages. You know, whenever you make an edit in Wikipedia, they log the change. Why might the edit pages of, of Wikipedia be interesting? What might you possibly learn about the world by studying edit, the edits in Wikipedia as opposed to... How things have changed over time. How things have changed, yes, you know, that's true, but what, what kind of bigger thing can you learn about? So censorship. How might you use this to learn about censorship? Right. So the question, studying, studying the, the edit, reap, edit pattern tells you something about controversies within communities. Okay? They, 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 you know, they tell you when there is disagreements about things. Right? Anything else that you might learn from looking at Wikipedia edit? Yeah? You might learn something about which pages are more famous or controversial. Okay? that the things that have the most changes tend to be controversial figures, so yeah? Uh, rate of development in a particular subject. You, you might learn something if you look at saying that this is a, 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 a rate of change, if you, th if you view the changes as being as the article getting bigger and bigger, you could imagine that there's periods of time when there is a lot of news, let's say, or a lot of change that happens in this. So, you know, that, that you know, it's clear that Donald Trump's Web, you know, Wikipedia page went a lot, has had a lot more edits recently than it did before. And, you know, when, when he changed and started doing things. So when there are, it gives you a, a way to change, tell when there are events associated with something in a handy way. Okay. Any other ideas? Okay. You know, there are certain communities. Some people study this as sort of as a social network because you do have, you know, Editors or people 
Editors communicate with other editors, like in trying to decide whether to roll back a change. Or they'll say, you know, this says, you know, Skeena's article says Skeena is a good computer science professor. You can see one of them asking, is he really that good? I didn't think he was that good. You can see there's a social network and a discussion there, right? And this gives you, you know, something that's accessible to get to these kind of issues. And so repurposing this kind of metadata, you know, it, it, it is, is an important thing in many, in many kind of projects. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. So where does data come from? I'm going to look at, I'm going to claim seven different places where I say most data sets come from. Okay, they come from, you know, something you own. They come from something the government owns. They come from something a president, a, a professor owns or a university owns. They come from things that Google owns or that, that's on a web page. They come from uh, some kind of a sensor, okay, that is embedded someplace in the universe. They come from perhaps a crowd, okay, collected from a crowd of people, or there's something you built by yourself. Okay, so let's look at these kind of things. So what are proprietary sources? If you work for a company, you have access to data that that company works on, okay, and often there are interesting and exciting data sets within an organization. Who works for a company that had a particularly exciting data set where they were back home? I know many of you had jobs. Yeah, what were you? Okay, so now this sounds very cool. Does everybody see this? That if you had a table of all the credit card information in the world, okay, then, and, and you had a sense of which ones of these were fraud, proved fraudulent and which ones didn't, this would be very, very cool to look at. I'd love to know all different ways people commit credit card fraud, okay? You know, I'm sure there's all kinds of interesting things you can do with. Now, if I were to call your boss and say, can you send me that data set so I can work on it in the university, you would say, no, 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 right? Okay, so the truth is that many or all organizations tend to have interesting internal data sets that often they can't reveal or won't reveal. What interesting data set does Stony Brook have that it won't reveal to me if I wanted to deal with it? Yeah? Probably student information. You know, I would, it would be very, very interesting to be able to look at all the students in here and predict their GPA next semester or something like that. And the trouble is they won't give it to me. Yeah? Okay, so I see. So you're saying that Tinder's a dating site and that they compute, they compute a score, like I was asking you guys to compute, right? Whereas instead of rating a country, we're going to rate a, rate a person. You know, you're 17, 23, 19, in terms of desirability. And, you know, anyway, but again, these things are usually not possible to get. If you're inside, then um, companies usually have data access policies, even inside the company. If you're the receptionist for his um, credit card company, you couldn't just say, oh, send me the data here. There's, you know, usually within companies there are walls of who can see what, and, and you need to have some training for it and stuff like that. Um, now, occasionally com companies will, will, some of the companies will, will release some of their data according to some kind of an API, usually with a limit to prevent you from scraping too much of it, okay? So you can get tw some tweets from Google, from, from Twitter. You can get some searches and, trans and, and certain services from Google, okay? But if you pound them too much, the, uh, you know, they're gonna be, you're going to be blocked and stuff like that. Any questions? Okay, so that's one source of data. Another source of data that is, that is interesting that is, is, is government sources. Because first of all, a couple things make it, so for example, if you go to a website called data.gov, that is the government's, the federal government's collection of all the data sets that have been, it has released, and there's something like 100,000 different data sets on everything under the universe, okay? And, you know, governments are, at least in the, you know, in the United States, are increasingly committed to trying to release data 
when they can, as opposed to keeping it as a secret or a silo or things like that. And, um, you know, there is also a law in the United States called the Freedom of Information Act, which says that if there is information that you think the government should give you that they have, you can file a formal request for that information. And the, the uh, agency has to reply, either give you the data or explain why they can't give it to you. Okay? So, um, you know, usually the reason why they can't give it to you has something to do with releasing, with preserving privacy. But there are a lot of data sets that don't have personal identifiers and things like that that, that, that they can release. And this is often an interesting thing. Any questions about government data? Has anyone ever seen an interest, particularly interesting government data set? Yeah? Okay, so you can get a, a list of every plane that has crashed in India, okay? Hopefully it's not that big a list. But, uh, but nonetheless, you're right. That, that again, undoubtedly, whenever there is an accident, you know, the, 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 the agencies that are in charge of regulating accidents and stuff like that do keep, will, will undoubtedly keep track of things like this. Okay, yeah. Well, what, what, that, what, what, what the truth is, is that, that in the United States, you have 50 different states, and they have different laws, and they have different state agencies with different policies towards releasing things. And it's often the case that you can get what you want easily from some states rather than others. So one, one, one example has to do with voter identification data. So, you know, when you register to vote in the United States, you know, there, there is a... Uh, a registry of who is, who is allowed to vote. And on some states, you can basically just request it, and they'll send you the list of all the registered voters in that, that state with their, their names and addresses and, and stuff like that. But other states are more restrictive with that data, okay? And so, you know, so yeah, so, you know, and it's probably true that, that, that it's easier to beg somebody to, um, for something when there's a precedent that another state has felt that it's, it's fair. I can believe that. Okay, any questions about government data? That seems like a reasonable thing. You know, in academics, okay, you know, in the course of doing university or academic research, you typically often produce data sets. Um, historically, what you would do is if you would work hard to produce a data set, the last thing you wanted to do was to give it to anybody else because you wanted to keep working on it to suck everything you could out of this. Because, you know, it was hard work to make a data set. Um, there has started to be a more of a, let's say, uh, ethos of sharing. Okay, like, for example, when you publish a paper in a biology journal, if you do any DNA sequencing, you have to have that sequence data stuck in a database before they will let you publish your paper. Okay? And it used to be people would hold on to this for dear life, to, you know, to make sure nobody else could discover anything. So... Bottom line is if you have any kind of an economic question or a medical question or a demographic question or a meteorological or scientific question, there probably are large data sets available on anything that you kind of care about. And so, you know, you should know how to look for it. How do you look for academic data sets? Often what you, I mean, obviously the first thing you will do is Google something, you know, say I want weather data or something like that. But the other thing that's often true is that if you find a paper that, uh, that has a, uh, you know, that, that's on a particular subject, sometimes the, the guy has the data but hasn't, let's say, put it someplace that's obviously findable. You know, contacting the author is, is often a good way to find, to, to, to get data and stuff like this. Any questions? So you should know that you should, it's important to kind of know what should be available, to have a sense of what should be available so you can grab it when you can. Any questions? Okay, good. Now, um, scraping is a common way computer scientists get data. You know, a lot of data is, is you know, there's databases that are exposed to the web often by either you have, a, have made a lot of web pages or you have a search query that will return data from a database. 
Scraping is the art of downloading a web page and extracting the information content from it so that you can build your own data set from it. And um, you know, this is something that is commonly done. Um, and that there tend to be a lot of uh, you know, there are libraries in Python to help parse and, and scrape these kind of web pages. But um, things to be aware of is sometimes people will scrape a, a source where the, the, the people who, who built the, the web page provided sort of an API. They realized people are going to want to hit their website and scrape the text. And that's annoying to them. Instead, they sometimes make an API available. So look before you scrape. Also look to see if somebody else has written a scraper. The amazing thing that I have found these days is whenever I have a project with students in mind, to say, oh, gee, we could scrape this. You know, you go look, you know, what they type in is scrape uh, the website name Python into Google. And there exist libraries for scraping Amazon, for scraping Google, for scraping, for, for scraping you know, all the major sites. And so, you know, look before you write, okay? And also look at the terms of service. You know, there is a, um, the websites for, uh, you know, any website typically includes a term of service that will say under what condition can you use this web data, this data. And often they will say you're not allowed to scrape it. Um, if you are a, a, a company that can get sued, you certainly don't want to scrape a website that says that you can't or redistribute data from a website that says you can't. Okay, if you're a, a, a quiet graduate student and you're not going to do anything too horrible, you know, you, you have to decide what you can do with it. But recognize that that in, in principle there are limits on this that are legal. There are legal limits on these kind of things. Any questions? You know, figuring out exactly what those limits are are sometimes kind of tricky. So, you know, but but anyway, that's that. Any questions about scraping? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So can you, uh, if you can you use that data for your research and publish it later on? Like can you publish it or use that data? Okay. So there's a question of you know what do you what what can you do with data that you shouldn't have scraped? Okay. You know to a certain extent if you do it in mod if you do it in modest amounts and you keep quiet usually you don't get into trouble. Okay. Now what you're asking about is if I did illegally scrape a large amount of data. Can I write a paper about it and get it uh, published someplace? Sometimes they are going to. A referee might be smart enough to ask, you know, is this legal what you're doing? Okay. And certainly under those cases, you what, what the people get really upset about is if you redistribute the data. So they are, you know, in general, they, again, they're, they're, you know, there's questions of what what are they you legally allowed to do, which is usually nothing. There's then questions that what will you get in trouble for? Taking somebody else's data and redistributing it to, to other parties is a good. That's a good way to get in trouble. Okay, scraping it and doing something quietly is is usually less of a problem. Okay, any questions? But again, that's not legal advice. Okay, so uh, so don't take it as legal advice. Any questions? Okay, good. The other thing is that that, that there's places on the web where people have accumulated large data sets. That, uh, that are kind of bulk downloads that you can do. You can download all of Wikipedia. Or you can download all of the movie database. You can download all of something called the Million Song Database, which takes for like a million songs what are a variety of properties of each of these songs. Okay? And there's a lot of interesting things you can kind of do with these things. So, you know, so, so there's amazing data sources out there if you look. Any questions? Okay, good. Um, you know, another source of data is has to do with from sensor networks. Um, you know, they're, they're one of the things that I find kind of amazing is that these days the, the collections of data from there's enough different kind of possible inputs to data that you can you know from that that are things that you wouldn't think of as sensors on the world that if you use the data in the right way, you can do things that are like sensors with things that aren't sensors. Okay, so what do I mean? You know, one group project I thought that was very cool was 
it would be great if you had a weather station weather stations planted all over the country to be able to tell whether it's sunny or not at any given point. But building a, a network of a million safe stations would seem like an expensive job. But on the other hand, these days there are these photo sharing sites where people load up pictures from things, right? And if you look at the sky in the pictures of, of what people load, you can get a tremendous record of whether it was sunny or cloudy at any given point on Earth at any time of day. Can everybody kind of get that? So that sign of the, 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 the photos from these pictures can kind of be weather sensors if you know how to interpret it right. Okay, and that I always thought was very clever. One thing that I thought was very clever was I read about a group that tried to detect earthquakes by using um, cell phones. What did they do? If you loaded the appropriate app to share your accelerometer data, you know, there's something in your cell phone that plots when you're, you know, measures how fast you're moving this device. If they have data from millions of devices as to how much the thing is moving, if there is an earthquake going on here, all of your phones are going to start moving, right, in a very coordinated way. And so the idea of looking at, I mean, you know, you leave your, um, phone in your pants pocket and you put it in the dryer, it's going to move and create a lot of accelerometer stuff. But if you have a large number of, of sensors, all of which are seemingly moving in sync, okay, that would suggest that, so you can kind of make the world, you know, your cell phone can be interpreting the world as um, seismometers all around the country. So the bottom line to doing these kind of things, if you have access to a data source, the thing that is important is to try to log that data. Okay, and the thing that, that, that I find that's kind of hard to, for me to keep track of anyway is how cheap storage is these days. It's amazing to me that every time someone, you know, eats a strawberry, that should something that should be an event that should be logged someplace because, you know, the number of strawberries being eaten in the United States is only in the billions and, you know, you could afford the cost of, rec you know, on a $300 disc of keeping a record of every single strawberry that was ever eaten, okay? And so if you have a way of acquiring this data, it's good to store it up. Any questions? Okay, fair enough. Okay, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more at some point, possibly soon, about crowdsourcing. But um, one thing that uh, to be aware of, an, a, another source of data is that often people can hire out to a crowd of people who are willing to work cheaply to help you get that data. Maybe they will volunteer, as in something like Wikipedia, where you can have a job, write, uh, write me a week, uh, an encyclopedia. You know, Jimmy Wales said, write me an encyclopedia, and then sat down, and then everybody in the world started writing his encyclopedia for him. That's a good thing, okay? The alternative is also that there are these services, like Amazon Turk and Crowdflower, where you can hire people to do piecework. And often, if you're clever, you can get your data built up by a lot of people, possibly by paying them. Any questions? But I think I'm going to talk more about crowdsourcing later. And the final source of data that I would like to think people should be aware of is to recognize that you can actually do things yourself. This is something that, that, that I find computer scientists don't think about very much, OK? Um, when I work with biologists, these biologists are used to spending months or years in a lab to get a data point, okay? And they work late at night and they, you know, and computer scientists are not used to actually working for data, okay? Um, you should be aware that you as a person, if you can enter one record by typing per minute, in the course of two days, you can enter a thousand records. Does everybody kind of believe that? So, so it's sometimes the case that um, t if data exists on paper or a PDF file that's hard for you to extract, you shouldn't immediately say, oh, I can't do it. It doesn't exist. It may mean you actually have to do the entry yourself, and that there's nothing wrong with that. Any questions? Okay, good. Okay, those of you guys have all seen a lot of these videos that we had of projects last year. And you know that part of the projects, the videos in these projects, students had to come and get data for their things. 
not forget what they did, or maybe tell me what they did. But let's just think, where might we find data for these kind of challenges? This is kind of just to see if we can, uh, as a, a exercise here. So one of the projects was on predicting who's going to win a Miss Universe beauty contest, right? What data should be available and where might you get it? Any idea? Wikipedia? What kind of thing would, might you get, would you expect to get from Wikipedia? All the contestants who participated, uh, where they got, uh, the country they come from. So the claim is that somebody might have entered the data in Wikipedia and that that might be a, uh, a, a data source, okay? Fine, I can believe that. Any other data? That would tell you some of the statistics about a, uh, a um, contestant there. Any other data that might be interesting or question? The pageant what? Have a website. The what? The pageant, would have a the pageant would have a website, although whether they have data that is interesting for building models is a separate question. Okay, yeah? News articles? What? News articles? News articles would probably have something to read about the site, okay? And maybe if you wanted to uh, develop a dossier on all of these people, maybe there's going to be f information about them that is not in the Wikipedia page, that by reading it you'll get more facts to enter about the individual contestants or something like that. That I can believe. Any other sources of, yeah. what? So what? Social networks means what? Okay, so some of them are going to have profiles, you're saying, on social networks, and maybe you'll learn more about them from that, right? And so that's a data source, that's right. Again, now notice that, that the problem here is that, that, that it's, you, you're getting data about individual contestants that, that's quite, you know, you don't know that what, the same thing is not necessarily available about all of the contestants, right? Some may have a social page, some may not. And so that's one of the reasons why it might be hard to gather data on something like this. Any other ideas or questions about things? Yeah. Crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing. So one way, if you want to predict who's winning, if you kind of flashed up the pictures of these people and said, who, who's going to win? Who, who do you think should, 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 should win? Okay. That might very well give you some kind of an information about it. So I think I kind of agree with that, that that might be interesting. You know, yeah. Right, so you might want to say these contests you're saying are conceptually similar to other contests in that thing. Maybe I would be wanting to expand my universe of things that I select on. I can kind of believe that, okay? Any other ideas that came up? So, so the question of can you have a, something that given a picture rates us, comes up with a, a score of beauty or something like that. And there's other places where you're saying similar issues are being done. Right. So, you know, his attractiveness score thing. Okay, good. Okay, let's say we got that. Suppose you wanted to predict the gross of a movie. What kind of stuff might be interesting? What kind of data sources might be available for that? Trade journals. Trade what? Journals. What? Trade journals. Trade journals. This is book. These are books or magazines about the movie industry. That's a data source. Again, that's something that you have to read by yourself. So that's, you know, you know there's, there's work to go from that to something you would stick in a model. Yeah? IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes are, are, are sites that have data explicitly about movies. So these are things that I would want. I'd want to download all of IMDb. I'd want to scrape Rotten Tomatoes, okay, which is a movie review site, okay? What? The studios. The studios have data, have data about, about some of their movies. Okay. So you might very well learn something from a studio, okay? Any other data sources that might be relevant here? Box, yeah. Box over of mode. So, so what you're saying is you're looking to gather it from some data site that is collecting it. Somebody's got to read the trade journals and enter the numbers. And it, it's better if it's not you, right, is what you're trying to say. Okay, and I think I believe that. Any questions? Yeah. So you're saying that if you went to IC, so you say that there are these places like Fandango and Google, we can find out what movies are, what, what theaters are showing it. Yeah. Possibly, but that's actually interesting. By scraping this kind of, by crawling, if Google doesn't complain, by crawling all of the movie listings, at any given point, you would probably know something about the popularity of these movies. 
Okay, and where are they popular? Where are they not popular? That might be kind of interesting. Okay, so that that does seem like an interesting data source for something. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. Um, baby weight. Suppose we want to try to predict the the weight of a newborn baby. Okay, from you know from you know how might we what what data might be relevant to this kind of a thing? Hospital data. Now, what about hospital data? Do we expect that you can go call the hospital and say, give me all the data on all your patients? Okay, the answer is no. Okay, but so hospitals may have that kind of data, but my instinct is that it's probably hard to get that directly from a hospital, right? Where might you expect to go to get data about this? What? So certain health organizations, things that are concerned about public health, undoubtedly are monitoring things about, you know, about, you know, uh, you know, baby weights and health, you know, maternal health and things like this. So I do suspect that these organizations have some data sets. I would imagine it's probably researchers who work for these organizations who have the, the, the real data set. There's undoubtedly someone in the organization that is interested in monitoring these kind of things. And they may have public data sets available. They may have people writing papers from which data sets are available, things like that. Any other ideas? Yeah? That's an interesting thing. Now, that actually is interesting, okay? Because now you, you could conceivably, I do kind of believe that if you took a look at social media posts, you would be able to tell which ones, a, a, a certain number of them, are announcing the baby, okay, is being born. And, uh, you know, it would be, you know, it'd be interesting to reconstruct something like that. I don't know what fraction of babies in, in the world get Twitter announcements about them, okay? Um, and, you know, and of course, they're all going to be different to parse and stuff like that. But that, that actually, I kind of like that idea. I can believe that you can get a lot of those kind of announcements. Any other ideas? Okay, so maybe that's a good idea. What if you wanted to predict the price of a painting at auction? Where might we expect to find data here? Auction sites where Auction, auction ha sites, presumably, you know, they clearly are going to post what's available to be bought. Whether or not they keep records that are public about how much people paid for it, okay? So you, you want to get that kind of data, and maybe it's available on auction sites. Okay. Any other ideas where you might get data like that? What? Newspapers for famous paintings. Newspapers, the stuff is described in newspapers for famous paintings, but presumably you would want to be able to do it for a broader set of things. So I agree with you that the very most famous, the record prices are going to be in there, but they're probably going to be hard to find in large scale. So Wikipedia about painters might be might be available. Okay. You know, so there there may be that if this is a, a painting in a museum, let's say there may be some some data posted by the museum. Okay. The thing that is probably true is that if there is something economic going on, like a uh, art auctions, somebody has made it their business to collect all of this data. And so one way to get it is to pay money to the guy who made the business for it, right? And it turns out that, you know, when, you know, that for a not unreasonable price, you can get access to a database of auction results that were collected across auction houses, okay? And that might, may or may not be better than building your own. What about trying to figure out if it's going to snow on Christmas? Where would you go for data on that? The government weather service has, you know, records going back 100 years on, um, you know, the weather at any place where there is a real station, right? So that would be my obvious place for going. Any other ideas of where you might get data about weather that would be interesting? Instagram photos. Instagram So if you want to find out, you know, I guess, you know, um, if you, you, know, you could analyze Instagram photos, that's probably, again, it's a trickier project. And... Uh, you know, the question is, are there gaps in what you wouldn't know from the government sites that you would learn from that?
that's what would be kind of I is interesting to know. Okay, so you're saying that uh, okay, so if you know something about let's say whether people are are, are fearing a big wi a cold winter or not, that maybe can tell you something. Although I presumably by if the people can figure out that it's cold, it, the, the data that you have from the weather service should tell you it's been cold. So you're saying that if people were good at predicting if it was going to, fe feeling in their bones that it was going to be a cold winter. Right. I see. Okay. We agree that we agree that sales of it will tell you something about what people's fear of winter is going to be. Okay. My guess is that probably tells you more about last winter than the coming winter, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, let's keep going. We want to predict Super Bowl football players. Let's go through these quickly. Results of football games. What, ki what kind of data should be available? The SPN has, a, has an open data set on, on, on past okay. uh, performances at player, the actual the player level. Like how so, and so for each player, the claim is that their websites, you say like ESPN, okay, there's other ones that will keep track for each player what is their performance, okay? Any other ideas of where you might go? Yeah. Fantasy League. So there are these bigger data sets. There's this, turns out there's a universe of people who make up their own teams and, and you know, reward themselves if, they're, if it's their simulated team does well. And their simulated team depends upon knowing knowledge of statistics. So the bottom line is that there are certainly statistic sources for outcomes of past games, player performances and things like that. That's right. Now the Google Pool project was going to try to tell which, given a bunch of celebrities, who was going to die next. What was going to be the, what, what, um, what data sets here what might be interesting, yeah? What? Insurance companies. Okay, so insurance companies do tell you something about the price of insurance that they are selling. Tells you something about what their perceived risk is of, uh, of dying. So you're right that there's certain actuarial models and tables that would come out of insurance companies that would probably be potentially helpful. Any other ideas? Yeah. So one question, if you have a particular group of people, is there, can, do you have any inside dope that they're sick or anything like that? Like, uh, you know, like when you read the news that Hillary Clinton has pneumonia, maybe you, you mark her down for, uh, you know, <laughs> But uh, but that no, she's going to be fine. Don't worry about it. Um, the but yeah, so that might be something. Okay, getting news about current health conditions for them might be interesting. Okay, any other ideas? You know, Wikipedia was interesting because you have half a million people who have died in Wikipedia. Okay, and so you can get some statistic demographic information just from that. Undoubtedly, there's a lot of medical research and demographic research that would govern life expectancies, things like that. Okay, what about predicting gas or oil, uh, gold or oil prices? What? You say trading websites? Futures prices. Okay, so the claim is that there's, what you're probably most interested in is price data on futures or uh, various other financial um, instruments that you could sell. And the claim would be that, 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 that there's got to be a variety of commercial services and websites that have to collect this kind of data. Okay, any other ideas where to go? Yeah. Is economic data of companies, where might you get that? Could be the individual companies, but that's probably a lot. Com of co countries, okay. Right. Okay, so there's a lot of different data you might very well get on that. Any questions about that? Okay, so it's important uh, to have a sense as to willing to look for these things and stuff like that. Any questions? Okay, so that's what I really wanted to say about data collection. I've still got about 10 minutes. So let me talk about, um, start talking a little bit about cleaning. So 
one of the, um, what, what typically happens to process is first you knew nothing, then you found the data set. Then once you have a data set, what you quickly discover is that there is a certain amount of processing that you have to do on your data set to prepare it for analysis, okay? There's problems that can come up. There's problems of missing values. There's problems of sometimes you, you want to estimate something that doesn't exist, the zero counts. There's going to be a certain amount of, when you're integrating data from several sources, there are inconsistencies about that, that you have to unify away. And this is what I th say goes into the category of general data cleaning, okay? And data cleaning is an important thing. And um, in particular, what I'd like to distinguish is a fundamental difference in talking about data. So this, I think, is an important distinction what I'm about to give you. is the difference between errors in data and artifacts in data, okay? Errors, in my mind, represent information that has been lost because, um, what you call it, because you know, maybe it wasn't measured properly, maybe no one ever recorded it, something like that. The, the fact that when you, you know, noise in a measurement is a data error. But there's another phenomena of things that can go wrong that I call artifacts. And to my mind, an artifact is something that comes as a result of processing and how you dealt with your data systematically. So quite often in the course of taking data from one form to another, people introduce what I would call processing errors, okay, that cause, um, you know, uh, that, that, that are in principle correctable because you took a file, you transformed it into something else, you made some kind of a bug in the transformation. These kind of bugs are, are what produce what I would say are artifacts, which are systematic problems in interpreting your data. And a large part of what data cleaning is, is working on your data to make sure that you don't, haven't introduced any artifacts to it. That the weirdnesses are really due to the underlying data and not due to your processing. Quite often, the problems that occur are due to something you did or didn't do with your data more than a limitation of your source. And so, you know, so it's important to take your data, draw plots of it, visualize it, give it what I would call the sniff test to see if there are systematic errors in your processing, artifacts that you can correct. If there's systematic problems in the data and how it was collected, you can't fix that later. But artifacts are things you introduced and you can often get rid of. And the example that I'd like to give you, this is, is um, this problem. I was working with these people recently, these physicists, in trying to do a study of, um, what do you call it, uh, authorship patterns. And at one point, we had tried to look at all of uh, the, the authors in a data source on the life sciences called PubMed. And we wanted to try to look at who were the 100,000 most cited authors in PubMed, OK? And one thing that we did was plot what was the first year, the year that somebody, you can imagine if you took the 100,000 most prolific scientists, okay, what year did they start their career, okay? So imagine we're building a graph of, here it is year, here's the number of new scientists per year, okay, new top scientists that came out that year. Okay, what should this distribution look like? You want to say it should look flat, okay? And why is that? You're saying that there's the same number of scientists born each year who are going to grow on to be stars, right? Increase. What? It should increase. You say it should. Increase. Why should it increase? Because I read somewhere that 97% of all the scientists who ever... Okay, you're saying that as time goes by, they hire more and more scientists. More the university more always gets bigger. And, you know, so therefore, you know, if there's more scientists now, more of them are going to be writing more papers and stuff like that. Yeah? So you're expecting a certain number of bumps because of events that might happen. Like, uh, 
you know, but like a war. So you're saying basically one thing that might happen is maybe if there was a war, suddenly all these scientists end up going to serve in the war, right? And these guys drop down. So you might imagine that there might be bumps like that, okay? Any other ideas of curves that might be? Okay, there might be missing data. You're saying for some reason maybe there would be missing data sometime. If for some reason the, the guy who's in charge of collecting, maybe one year they didn't publish any journals. The guy whose job it was to collect the journal publications went on strike or something like that. Maybe, okay? Any questions? So if I'm looking at a data set to see whether or not I believe that, that I haven't introduced any problems, I want a theory as to what my data should look like. So... When I had a st we were working on this, and we were trying to look at over time um, the number of scientists, new, new of the top 100,000 scientists, what year did they start? This was the graph that we got, okay, or that the student gave me. Now, the question is, why does it look like this, okay? And I want you to think about this. Because a lot of what I mean by tracking down an artifact is trying to say what here looks weird to you, and is it something that's there for real, or is it something there that is, you know, is fake, okay? Something that you introduced by a bug. So what, it, what, 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 what do people think when they look at this? What does it mean, yeah? You're thinking that it may mean, wow, well, that there's more innovative innovation at a time period. You're saying that what this shows is that people suddenly got a lot smarter in 2001, okay? And suddenly that there were a massive number of scientists born in 2001 who went on to become real stars. So there's nothing wrong with the data processing. It's reflecting the world. That might be one theory. They're looking at PubMed. So we're looking at the PubMed database, okay? Yeah. This data set is about publications. Yes. Like 